Hello friends, welcome to Limitless Life. My name's Larry Hutton, I'm your host, and we're gonna be getting back into the Word of God today because it's good, good, good news. I'm telling you, you, you in this world today with all the bad news that's all over the world and news channels and everything else, man, we need to hear good news. And good news is God loves you. Good news is God wants you healthy in your physical body. Good news is God owns all the gold, the silver, the cattle on a thousand hills, and he knows how to get it into your hands better than you do. Good news is God wants you full of his peace and full of his joy, mentally sound, not burdened down with cares and worries and anxieties and fears and all that. We serve a good, good God. God wants you blessed. He wants you living the kind of life Adam and Eve had, if you're familiar with them, back in the garden before sin ever entered the, the earth, the human race. I'm telling you, God wants you to live a fun, happy, fulfilled life. That's the kind of God we serve, and that's the kind of God we always talk about on this program because that's the God that changed my life, man, I'm telling you. I've had so many good things happen to me over the last number of years. I mean, uh, I was born in 1954, so you can do the math. But uh, when I was uh, 22 years old, after suffering for 22 years with an incurable disease that was like severe allergy, sinus, hay fever stuff, but it got worse to where I was allergic to like 120 different things. And I finally went to a church that believed Jesus is the same today as when he walked the earth. When he walked the earth, he healed the multitudes of every kind of sickness and every kind of disease. And he never told them, well, you gotta get good enough or you know, you're gonna have to quit eating this or start eating this or he never told anybody anything and all those multitudes of people he healed. He never told those multitudes to do this or that or that. He just said, be healed, be healed, set free, delivered, and ministered to him. I found out Jesus is the same today, and so then I ended up getting healed when I was 22 from that disease. And, and now when sickness and disease has attacked me all these years since then, I've been able to take the word of God and ward it off, get rid of it, not let it stay on my body, whether it was cancer that attacked my body a few years back or whatever. It doesn't matter what it is because Jesus paid a price on the cross and what the Bible says, he redeemed us. He, he made a payment for sin. The wages of sin is death. It's, it's separation from God. But the wages of Jesus' blood is connection back to God. Hallelujah. And uh, so that's wonderful wages. That's a ransom that Jesus paid for us. And now we can live the blessed life. So that's what we're all about. For those of you just joining us, we have been doing a series for over three weeks now. We're now in our fourth week uh, on a series that I've titled The Governing Power of Righteousness. Righteousness is where you are made right with God, all based on what Jesus did through the death of Jesus and through his resurrection. So it, it has nothing to do with your performance, you being good enough, you doing this, you doing that, you not doing this, stop doing that. No, it has nothing to do with that. Jesus' righteousness, God's righteousness, is 100% connected to Jesus. And it's a gift that God gives to man, not because man has earned it or deserved it, but purely because God loves him. And so when people accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior, they are made righteous. We will be looking at those verses as we get into this uh, series as well. But right now, people ask, so why teach on righteousness? Well, because in essence, righteousness governs practically every area of our lives. And you'll be seeing that as we get into a lot of the verses. We've already seen a lot of benefits of righteousness. So that's why we're discussing what it is, what it's not, what it does, what are the benefits, what are the guidelines. And our foundation text has been Romans chapter 14, verse 17. We'll put it back up on the screen for you. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of God is where that verse starts. The kingdom of God. Now remember what... John said in uh, John chapter 3, he said, when you're born again, or Jesus actually said this, but it's in John's gospel. Jesus said, when you're born again, you are put into the kingdom of God. And then Jesus also said in Luke 17, 21, the kingdom of God is in you. Don't look for it over there or over here. The kingdom of God's within you. So you're in the kingdom and the kingdom's in you. And that verse in Romans 14, 17 says, the kingdom of God is not about 
what you eat and what you drink, but it's about righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Like I pointed out before, I believe the reason they put righteousness first is because you cannot experience God's true peace or God's true joy if you're not made right with God. So that's why it's in that order. So righteousness is in the Holy Ghost. Peace is in the Holy Ghost and joy is in the Holy Ghost, all three of them. But of course, we're zeroing in on, on the first one mentioned, and that's righteousness, but specifically how it governs our life. And so we looked at uh, where Jesus is called and the Lord God is called Jehovah Sidkenu. Remember over in Jeremiah 23, 6, 2 Chronicles 12, 6, uh, we see the Lord our righteousness, or, and the Hebrew word is Sidkenu. So the Lord's our righteousness. And we found out because he's our righteousness, he judges according to that righteousness. So he's not unrighteous in his judgments. He always judges according to righteousness. And so that's why we looked at a number of scriptures that even showed us we don't have to be afraid of the great white throne, throne judgment. We don't have to be afraid of God's judgment when we miss it, when we sin. I mean, you need to go back and listen to all those verses we looked at. It's pretty amazing. It takes away all fear when you realize, man, I'm part of the family. And even when I screw up, which I don't want to, I mean, I'll repent when I do. But thank God, even when I screw up, I'm still in right state standing with God. That goes against a lot of religious teaching. And of course, Romans chapter 4, one of my favorites in verses 22 through 24, where it says God does not impute sin to us. He's not counting up or holding our sins like he said in 2 Corinthians 5. God doesn't hold things against us after Jesus bore our sins. So he doesn't impute, that verse says. I'm not making this up. I'm showing you what Scripture says. Romans 4, uh, 22 through 24. God doesn't impute sin. What does he impute? The word impute means, means what does he put on our account? It says he imputes righteousness to us. So again, it has nothing to do with because you and I do everything right, but it has to do with the fact that Jesus did everything right. And so now God judges us according to that righteousness. And I also pointed out, because you're in Jesus and Jesus is in you, there's no sin in Jesus and there's no unrighteousness in Jesus. So that means there's no sin in you. You may be sinning with that body, you may be sinning with that mind, but in you, the whole, you are complete. Remember Colossians 2.10, you're complete in him. 1 John 4.17, that as he is, so are you in this world. So... Uh, you, you are perfect. You are completely perfect. You're not going to be any, made any more perfect when you get to heaven. Now, your body will and your mind will, but not you, the spirit, the eternal man won't. won't. And then we looked at um, the um, six fundamental foundational principles of the doctrine of Christ found in Hebrews 6. We found out the very first one is repentance from dead works. That's actually a reference to righteousness. Repentance means to change your mind or to think differently. And then the dead works is a reference to keeping the law of Moses to earn right standing with God. So righteousness was the very first fundamental and foundational principle of the doctrine of Christ. So we have to think differently under the new covenant than they did under the old covenant. That's what repentance means, a change of thought, think differently. So then we looked at Romans 3 that righteousness... Um, uh, the righteousness of God without the law is now manifested because of Jesus coming along. You now have righteousness disconnected from the law, connected to faith in Jesus. Uh, Galatians 2.16, no one can become righteous by keeping the law. Galatians 3.11, righteousness is now faith in Jesus that the just shall live by faith. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 and 9 tell us the law of Moses was not given for the righteous. It wasn't given to you and me. It was given to the unrighteous. So what was the purpose of the law? That's what we've been talking about the last few programs is what was the purpose of the law then? Because it was just, it was good, it was holy, but what was the purpose of it if it wasn't for us and couldn't make you right with God? Well, in a nutshell, it was, reve it was to reveal to the Israelites that they were incapable of living free from sin, that it was impossible for them to keep the law, and that their condition of having a right relationship with God was a hopeless one. Thus, they needed a savior. <laughs> so that's, it, in a nutshell, the purpose of the law. But then we started looking at the scriptures that talk about the different purposes of the law. I told you I was going to give you five. So number one was the purpose was of the law was to take 
take us to school, give us a fail, failing grade, and then point us to the one who could help us pass the test, and that's Jesus. So that was the first uh, purpose of the law was to take us to school, to be our schoolmaster. Galatians 3, 24 and 25 says, Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster uh, th to bring us to Christ. And then verse 25, it said, But, but uh, after faith came, then we are no longer under that law. We're no longer under that schoolmaster. So the law was a schoolmaster that was to lead us to Christ. Remember, Galatians 3.21 says, The law could not give a man eternal life nor make him righteous. So the law was a schoolmaster given to the Jews to give them a failing grade and lead them to Christ. Uh, so it just really brought them to an end. That's what the law, one of the purposes, the law was to bring you to an end to yourself and show you a need for the Savior. You need a Savior. You can't do it on your own. The second purpose of the law then was to shut every man's mouth and to show everyone that they were guilty before God. Romans 3.19. Now we know that whatever things the law says, it says to them who are under the law, that, in other words, here's the purpose, that every mouth may be stopped. Shut up. <laughs> every mouth may be stopped. Don't you brag on yourself how good you are. You're going to get through, get to heaven because you've done this, this, that. Nope. Shut up. Every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. So this says the law shuts everyone's mouth and makes everyone guilty before God. So that means the law holds everyone accountable and God accepts no excuses. That's what it means. So again, number one, the purpose of the law, the first one mentioned, the purpose of the law was to take us to school, give us a failing grade, and point us to the only one who could help us pass the test. That's Jesus. Per, uh, number two, the second purpose of the law was to shut every man's mouth and to show that every one of them are guilty before God. And then last program, we got to the number three, uh, the law. The th uh, third purpose of the law was to bring the knowledge of sin so that people would, would be able to know what sin is and what it isn't. Uh, let's go back to Romans 3 where we were on this one. The law brought the knowledge of sin. I want you to see this. Romans 3.20, we'll put it up on the screen for you. Therefore, therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified or declared righteous in his sight. So by keeping the law, you could not be made right, could not become just. For... By the law is the knowledge of sin. So it didn't say it could free you from sin, but it sure could, sure could give you knowledge. In other words, if you were doing something that was sin, but there was no law telling you it was sin, you wouldn't have the knowledge of sin. You wouldn't know it was sin. Uh, remember Galatians 3.19, what's the purpose of the law? Um, it was added because of transgressions. It added because of sin. In other words, the law was added to show you how sinful you are, and that you are a sinner, period. <laughs> now, look at Romans chapter 5. We haven't gone there yet. Let's go over to Romans chapter 5. In Romans chapter 5, I want to start out with, well, let's read verses 12 and 13. There's so much here in this fifth chapter. We may have to camp here for a while. But Romans chapter 5, verse 12, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world. The one man is talking about Adam. You probably know that. By one man, sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. For, verse 13, until the law, until the law of Moses, in other words, until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. Do you remember we looked at that word imputed in another verse? This one, uh, well, in, in Romans 4, as a matter of fact, the previous chapter. But here, the word imputed is the same Greek word. It's an accounting term, and it means to keep a record of. To keep a record of. So God is not keeping a record of our sins. Or this says he's not keeping a record of sins before the law of Moses. So that's what, what it says. Wherefore, by one man uh, sin entered the world, death by sin, so death passed upon all men that all have sinned, for until the law, 
sin was in the world, but wasn't imputed to them. So this is really talking about God was not keeping a record of sins before the law of Moses. Now, of course, that could bring up a plethora of questions. <laughs> if God wasn't keeping any record of sins, then does that mean people that were sinning under the old covenant would go to heaven or go to hell or what? You know, I mean, people ask, well, what about Cain? You know, is Cain in heaven? You know, he murdered Abel, but there was no law. Hmm. I've even, I've even heard people use 1 John 3.12. In fact, I probably ought to show you that because I've heard them use this verse to say that Cain went to hell. I don't believe Cain went to hell. I think you're going to be surprised to meet him when you get to heaven. Uh, let me show you. I don't believe that's what is being said in 1 John chapter 3. Look at 1 John 3.12. Not as Cain who was of that wicked one. Oh, yeah, there you go, right there, brother. No, hang on. And slew his brother, so, so he was influenced by the wicked one. Sure enough, so was Eve, so was Adam. But let's, let's go on. Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother. And wherefore slew he him? Or why did he kill him? Because his own works were evil. In other words, killing Abel was evil. It was wrong. And his brother's righteous. So if, if this says Cain was of that wicked one and his works were evil and that proves that he went to hell, I don't believe that statement is any different than the one Jesus made when he spoke to Peter and said, Get thee behind me, Satan. He, told, he said that to Peter. So was Jesus calling Peter Satan? I don't believe he was, and you know he wasn't if you studied the passage out. Jesus was not calling Peter Satan, and I don't believe John here was calling Cain part of Satan's kingdom. Both Cain and Peter were both influenced, and they were both yielding to Satan's temptations and leadings. I mean, think about it. If Cain was going to go to hell because he murdered somebody, then what about Moses? Moses murdered the Egyptian what about David? David committed adultery and then murdered the husband of the one he committed adultery with. <laughs> yeah. So are Moses and David going to be in heaven? <laughs> well, that's another whole <laughs> that's another whole series in and of itself. Maybe we'll have to get to that to another time, but right now we are talking about verse 13, until the law, let's not get sidetracked here, until the law, sin was in the world, but sin was not imputed or held against you when there's no law. Therefore, one of the reasons for the law was to help people know the difference of right and wrong. And that's what it's saying right here. But it did not stop them from sinning. In fact, just the opposite was true. The law actually magnified. When it gave you the knowledge, it magnified your sin, which brings us, I think we have time to cover part of this. We may have to pick back up, but um, it brings us to the fourth purpose of the law. The fourth purpose of the law, the law was given so that sin would flourish so that it would come alive and abound. <laughs> Look, look at Romans 5.20, Romans chapter 5, verse 20. It said, So, moreover, the law entered, or it was given, that the offense, talking about the sin, might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. So, this says the law came in so that the offense, or the sin, might abound. The law was given so that sin would abound. That means it came alive like never before. And that's what Paul said in Romans chapter 7, verse 9. He said, the law caused sin to come alive in me. And then in that 13th verse of Romans 7, Paul said, the law made sin exceedingly sinful. In other words, the law made sin worse. Well, I thought the law was given to keep people from sinning. It was, it was given to try and curb their sin, sure enough, but I'm telling you what, it couldn't stop you from sinning. It didn't set people free from sin. It actually 
strengthen sin. I'm going to show you that before I have to close today. It actually, and that's hard for people to believe when you say, what, what, what did you just say? The law strengthened sin? Yeah, it actually strengthened sin. It made it even harder for you to under, for you to get free from sin is because it just strengthened the sin that you already in, living in. Look at 1 Corinthians. This is so good. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse number 56. Again, we'll put it up on the screen for you. But 1 Corinthians 15, 56, the sting of death is sin. Okay, we can, we can believe that. Sin, sin stung real bad and caused death, so the sting of death is sin. And the strength of sin is the law. Whoa, what, what does that say? The strength of sin is the law? Wait, 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 wait a minute. What gives strength to sin? Help me out. What gives strength to sin? The law is what gives strength. The law strengthens sin. What does that mean? The law made sin stronger. <laughs> the law said, nah, I'm going to give sin some more muscle. <laughs> In other words, the sin just... Added, what's the old saying? Added fuel to the fire. Hmm. The more, the more you tried to keep the law, the stronger your sins became. Whoa. <laughs> and of course, the more you tried to keep the law, the stronger your sins became, and the stronger your sins became, the more you felt condemned, and the more you felt condemned, the more you felt away from God, which is what we were looking at earlier in 2 Corinthians 3. We'll probably have to go back there in the next program and just really highlight some things maybe we didn't take time to highlight, but the law strengthened sin. It was given to make sin stronger so that you could realize I, in my own power and in my own righteousness, cannot live free from sin. I cannot. You, I need a Savior. Wow. All right. Well, we're out of time again today, and I wanted to mention something today I haven't mentioned for a long time. We have when, I, when somebody comes up to our product table and asks me, say, Brother Larry, what should I, what should I get? What should I buy? If I'm just going to buy one thing, because you know, I'll I'll take different things. Like the church I was just at recently down in Florida. Um, I was in Plant City, Florida at Family Life Church there, and um, I mentioned uh, to them, you know, I have to bring different things because I can't carry all the products to church, just have too much to fill out all the tables and everything, so I try and bring different things. But I mentioned, and I've done this before at other churches, uh, that if somebody comes up to the product table and says, I'm just going to buy one thing, what should I buy? I tell them the in him scriptures, in him scriptures, because in him is who God says you are, which of course righteousness is huge in the in him scriptures. In fact, we'll be looking more in him scriptures even as we get into this teaching. So in him is, it, well, it's actually like about two hours and 20 minutes of me quoting who God says you are, what God says you have, and what God says you can do. Who God says you already are, who he actually made you when you got in him, what God says you already have, that's what God's given you because you're in him, and then what God's enabled you to do because of being in him and having all that he's already given you, what are you enabled by that to do? So get in him. I'm telling you, it's, it's just a powerful... I don't preach or teach, by the way, for those of you that aren't familiar with my scripture recordings. This is a scripture recording. So all I do is quote scriptures on who you are, what you have, and what you can do. I don't teach or preach. And so two hours and 20 minutes of you listening, who God says you are, what God says you have, what God says you can do, you ought to go to bed at night listening to that every night and get up every morning listening to it. Do it for about one year. If you don't want to do it for a year, do it for six months, but do it for a while until those scriptures become a part of your thinking. So you think repentance from dead works. <laughs> no longer are you trying to do things to earn your way to heaven or, or to make God love you more, man. No, you're, you're in like Flint, man. You, you're already in. So anyway, those are available at our website at LarryHutton.org. All of our um, teachings and scripture recordings are all 
available there. You can download, if you don't want the CDs like I'm holding up, you can download the MP3s of the, of the scriptures. But www.larryhutton.org, that's larryhutton.org, or call our toll-free number 888-887-WORD, W-O-R-D. We are the Word. That's what this ministry is all about. I'm going to keep preaching and teaching the Word. So 888-887-WORD. If you look that up on your keypad, W-O-R-D, nine six seven three. So W-O-R-D, 888-887-WORD is our toll-free number. We have people there all around the year, no, no matter if it's a holiday or middle of the night, no matter what time you call, we'll have somebody answering the phones and they can take your order. And then uh, if you want to become a partner, well, I'm always thanking my partners. I was thanking them as this last church. I had a really good partner right there that just loves helping us get other people to hear the good news. And that's what our partners are helping you that aren't partners do. You're hearing good news, and this good news is going to change your life. You can actually become a partner and help other people that aren't partners hear the good news as well. I say it's one of the most unselfish things you can do is when, when you find a ministry that I love their teaching, I love what I'm hearing, it's changing me, it's helping me, I'm going to partner with them so I can help other people like me before I was a partner get the word so their life can be changed as well. Call that toll-free number, 888-887-WORD. Let them know you want to become a partner. We love you. We call you blessed. We'll see you tomorrow. Have a Jesus-filled day. If you would like to schedule Larry Hutton to speak at your church, event, or conference, go to LarryHutton.org and choose Contact Us from the menu bar or call 1-888-887-WORD. Do you know yourself, who you really are? Not the natural carnal person that the world says you are, but the saved, word-filled, Holy Spirit-empowered believer that you really are in the eyes of God. At times, each of us has struggled with our identity, ability, and purpose in our lives as believers. But God's Word is filled with His descriptions of who you really are in Him. In this two-part scripture recording, you will hear Dr. Hutton quote all the Bible scriptures about who you are in Christ, what you have in Christ, and what you can do in Christ. In Him scriptures will help you build and strengthen the very foundations of your faith, enabling you to believe and therefore speak all that God has created you to be, to have, and to do, not in your own power, but in Him. To order In Him scriptures, go to LarryHutton.org or call 888-887-WORD. Experience more of God's goodness by joining Larry Hutton again for more simple, practical teaching in God's Word. Go to LarryHutton.org anytime to watch this broadcast and many others. You'll also find special offers and other resources to help you thrive in life. Or check on Larry and Liz's schedule so you can join them at a meeting near you. Go to LarryHutton.org or call 888-887-9673.